welcome everybody to our first virus-free Zoom event at this lunchtime, um, where we are going to be in conversation with uh, the very wonderful Ezra Goldsmith. Now, I'm going to introduce Ezra to you. Um, she is a writer and a feminist activist and development consultant uh, of English Ghanaian heritage. And in 1975, she was the first woman of colour to be elected president of Leicester University Students' Union. While in 2001, she became the first woman of colour to be elected chair of the Fawcett Society as well. Uh, in 1997 to, 90 to 79, uh, Ezra served as one of the first black volunteers to be sent on voluntary service overseas in Tanzania. Um, she's also been a commissioner for the Women's National Commission, chair and co-founder of the Gender Development Network, vice chair of ActionAid, a trustee of the Equality and Diversity Forum. And she's got a really um, fantastic uh, uh, career really in feminist activism and it's going to be a really brilliant to have a conversation with her but I just want to let you know that I first met her when I was 19 volunteering at Narwe so I feel like I've known her for a very long time and I have a very personal connection to her as well so it's lovely to have her with us so well, I can't wait to hear more from you about your wonderful book that we're going to be hearing you read extracts from and discussing in a second. Um, I also want to introduce Fiona McTaggart now obviously you know Fiona she's our chair um, and she's been chairing Fawcett since April 2018. Um, but she, in her own right, is a leading feminist campaigner and former Labour MP for Slough. She's also a former Home Office Minister and Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities, and spent 20 years in Parliament but stood down uh, before the uh, last election, or the one before, the one before last. Throughout her professional life, she's campaigned to improve women's lives and fight inequality and discrimination. And most notably in her work on Labour's Older Women's Commission and Women's Representation, her campaigning to end violence against women and girls and her long-standing view that sex bias should be criminalized. She also chairs Agenda, which is one of our sister organizations. And Fiona too has known Ezra since, you know, she was 19 years old, a very long time ago. And we're gonna be sharing a few of those memories with you in a moment. So, um, Ezra has published The Space Between Black and White, this book, which I'm gonna wave at you now. You'll be able to get 10% off uh, with the uh, discount code that Jack Aranda, her publishers, have provided for us. Everyone watching, everyone who signed up to this event can get it as a, a discounted rate. It's an absolutely wonderful book, a real tearjerker, a really wonderful personal story, but also a story about social history and change, about racism and identity and feminism. So and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Ezra, I, I want to just start the conversation now. Sorry, I've been talking for far too long and now we need to hear from you. Um, and really to start off with you reading a first extract for us from this wonderful book. And you know, you, you re you've written it and you're, you're commenting as a mixed race woman who was brought up by a white working class family in London and then in rural Norfolk. The book is primarily about race and identity and begins with your experiences of growing up black in a very white childhood. When did you first become aware of that and, and in your sense of being different from your white family? Really, the, from my very earliest memories, absolutely, you know, three, four years old, I guess, I knew that I was different. And um, I spent the first six weeks of my life um, with my mum in an unmarried mother's home that they used to have in those days. And then eventually when my white working class family realized that my mum was absolutely refusing to have me ad adopted, um, there's a lot of pressure to do that. Um, they brought me home to uh, the estate in Shaftesbury Park um, uh, in South London. But I have to say that in those days, um, there were very, very few um, babies born out of wedlock, as they used to call it. And um, I don't know, maybe 5% less, probably. And uh, also, the number of mixed race babies were absolutely tiny. So uh, there wasn't that much um, uh, hope of me being adopted anyway. So I think my mother was absolutely anxious to hang on to me. She was 19. No, this is 1953. She was disabled and she was far from home. And she, I, I don't know, I don't think I'll ever summon up her courage. It was amazing. But she brought me home to this white working class estate. And uh, my family um, was very torn on the issue. Some of them were very racist and, you know, what are you bringing that colored girl home for? And others were very socialist. You know, my granddad in particular, who's a big character in the book, he was very egalitarian. And, you know, he, so he was the one that was a, a major 
major player in bringing me home. But I can remember, you know, my family telling me to ignore it. But I was, I w went out into the street and I was called w Woggy, Darky, who's been rolling in dog shit, you know, right from my earliest uh, um, age. So I had this kind of um, sense that my, that polite people didn't say anything about it. And then I'd get this barrage of, um, of uh, hatred, which I just didn't know what to do with. So I felt like, uh, the only way I can describe it is I felt like an alien dropped from outer space. I had no idea how I got to be this color. Uh, people talked about it being my dad, but my dad wasn't there. And I had no images of black people, all the books, all the kids books uh, were all, you know, white people. Everybody around me was white. I had no photograph of my dad at all. Um, so this, you know, I, I had this feeling of onlyness. And I think it's a major theme throughout my book, this, this feeling that wherever I went, I was an only one. And um, the, the book uh, opens up with um, being on uh, Clapham Common. So uh, I'll read you just a, a little bit of an, an extract of when I saw um, the first uh, black, uh, other black child that I'd seen in my life. I was, I was just, it was just before I started school. So I would just been playing on the swings. It was November, it was cold. And I was walking back with my auntie back home uh, to, for, for my tea. So in the foggy half light, I can just about make out a family group moving slowly across the grass ahead of us. As we get nearer, I can see they're wearing the strangest clothes, long robes and trousers, glimpses of red, gold and blue, with short jackets, scarves and hats to keep out the late autumn chill. The woman is wearing a, a green and gold scarf around her head, like a turban. They stand out in the fast fading light like a flock of brightly colored birds. The smallest bird breaks away from the group and runs towards me, a little girl about four years old, the same age as me. She has dark skin and black fuzzy hair like mine. We stop and stare at each other, spellbound, rooted to the spot. A sudden shock of connection, of recognition. I know you. Kumba, Kumba. I think it was Kumba they called her. Something like that. Kumba ran off to join her family and they moved off across the common and out of sight. It all happened so quickly. I can't quite believe what I've seen. I try to run after her, but Auntie Belinda holds me back. We have to go home now, she coaxes. Your mum will be back from work soon. It's getting dark and Nan will have tea ready. Tea time. It always interrupts something really important just at the wrong moment. I have stumbled on a secret. I'm not the only one. I'm not alone in the world. There are other others. And more than that, coloured people sometimes come in whole families. Who knew? Mum, dad, two kids, not just one-offs like me. I feel strange, excited, scared, shocked, all at the same time, but also comforted. You know, one of the things that I think as well about the book is how sad some of the early photographs are of you holding dolls and they're all white. Mm. And that must have been just kind of reinforcing that experience that you're describing then of feeling like the only one. Am I odd? Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I believe that that scene is uh, very much part of your history as well on uh, Clapham yeah. Common. Of course, well, I became councillor for the area where you lived in Shaftesbury Park Estate. And I live just close to the common. So I kind of know it. And of course, the common now, it wouldn't be rare to see another black. No. <laughs> and that's how the world has changed. And it's yeah. such a good change. But yeah. it must have been very lonely when you were wee. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, being on, uh, that was definitely a working class estate where in those days um, you uh, sort of lived and worked and played in the street and had your social life all pretty much in the same few streets. 
So Absolutely. people didn't walk, you know, they didn't so move food outside, yeah. In that area, it was one of the first ever black members of parliament. And I remember going out canvassing on the Shastri Park estate. Yeah. And a very old woman opening her door on me. And I said, I'm canvassing for the Labour Party. And she leaned forward and went, vote, vote, vote for Sackler Bala. <laughs> which was obviously the song that they sang when Sackler Bala was the local yeah. MP. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And my granddad knew John Archer, who was the first uh, uh, may black mayor of Battersea as he well. Wasn't he was a race, yeah. So, yeah, and there's a lot of history. Oh, about, you know, practically facing the common. Yeah, amazing. Right. All right, we've got to get back to the book, girls. Come on. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I do want to take you on to another section of the book, Ezra, because mm -hmm. we've got some wonderful um, additional chapters to. to go into here for you to read from um, and you know I think what came really strongly through to me from the book is what um, you know how your consciousness was sort of raised at a very young age you seem very kind of aware of your feminism and you were very kind of ex you know you're exploring it you were confident about it and that was really again quite inspirational to me I think so I just wanted to hear the section in the book where you first realized you're a feminist you know, that from the ice and fire chapter yeah, great. Thank you. Yes, um, this is one of my favourite chapters, actually, because it takes place over something like five hours. I mean, some of the chapters are several years, but this one is very intense and it's like ice and fire, These, you know, this contrast um, uh, uh, and it's sort of quite claustrophobic. And there I am in Norfolk, in the wilds of rural Norfolk. Would you, can you imagine that uh, in 1969, they had not, you know, Battersea was nothing compared to uh, people in Norfolk. They had hadn't seen anything like me. They were actually hanging out of their casement windows, staring at me as I walked past. And I'd been sent there because I'd been a naughty girl. I was uh, 14, 15. And uh, I, I kind of, I suppose I was quite depressed as a teenager. I got a growing sense of alienation. And, you know, there's just uh, the civil, height of the civil rights movement on the telly. I saw all these black people being shot down, you know, and Martin Luther the king dying and so on so I just got this feeling of onlyness and attack I felt under attack people like me were under attack so they uh, I, I you know did a bit of dr drugs and sex and rock and roll and so they sent me off in the countryside to uh, study for my O levels to a very strict aunt um, and she had four children, two boys, two girls, and she was very much, you know, gender definitions. And uh, the girls had to help with the washing up while the boys watched football and went out and sowed their wild oats. And she, I remember she said to me um, while I was there, you should never have been born because, you know, you're the wrong colour and you shouldn't have been born out of wedlock. So, you know, this was really stinging me. And that, that night, I suddenly remembered, we were sitting at the dinner table and she just told me I should never have been born. And I thought, I'm sure I've got a book upstairs that I bought with me. I rushed upstairs, got it out of the wardrobe, and it was The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir. And so I, I, I lay there, can you imagine me, little brown girl in the wilds of Norfolk with the snow all round, and I was under the covers as we used to be in those days, reading with a torch until daylight. I never knew that the wind had so many voices. The sound is almost human, wailing, shrieking, moaning like a woman in pain whirling around the little cottage all night as if it would tear it apart from the rafters. I was on fire. I kept reading that book by torchlight under the blankets to the sound of the howling tempest outside until my neck ached, the ice formed on the inside of the casement window and the snow plough came through at first light. It finally dawned on me. Now it all makes perfect sense. It explains everything, or almost everything. Thank you, Aunt Lucy. I know who I am now, and it's the best feeling ever. Age 15 and three quarters, I'm a women's liver. That's a wonderful chapter. I just love that so much. And I, I think just have the strength of character at that age 
to have even acquired the book and then brought it with you and, and going off at that moment when she said that to you to go and read it. I just think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So, you know, what, what's your kind of early feminist memory? Have you got a kind of moment when you say, actually, that's the thing that turned me into a feminist? Or do you feel you were always one? <laughs> I kind of think I was probably always one. I, I came from a family where it was very Scottish and very boys first-ish. And I was a kind of middle one, so I could sort of hide between my siblings. But it just seemed to me completely unfair that uh, my brothers were regarded as important and my elder brother was going to be a baronet, in fact. And why does it have to happen that way? So I think it was logical like that. But I also think that in the beginnings of second wave feminism, we really depended on books, on books like uh, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, other things, because they were key to uh, understanding what feminism was. Mm. You know, otherwise you just felt as though you were being grumpy and odd. And, uh, and those books kind of, you thought, oh my God, I'm not the only person who feels like this. Just like Esworth felt that she wasn't the only black child. I remember those moments reading people like Sheila Robottom. Oh, it makes sense. I'm not the only person to whom this kind of thing has happened. Yeah, really. Yeah. Cool. And that sense of connection, you yes. know, again, really comes through the book at key stages, that point of connection, both with others and also with your own sense of self and identity. It's really strong. And, you know, at a, at a young age, you know, that, that as a 15 year old, I think it's really, really powerful. Um, I want to move on to another section now, just because I, I, I do want to make sure we hear from you on, in all these different parts of the book, because it's, it's just a brilliant read. And this is um, probably my, after that one, my, my next favorite part, which is um, uh, when you were at university in Leicester. And um, there's, a, there's two parts here. One is Fiona's going to read a section for us. I think we're going to hear from Fiona first, actually. And then we're going to go to Esther to read her section. Um, but it's really about that sort of moment of, of real kind of activism and leadership at university in this chapter. So Fiona, let's, let's hear your section first, and then we'll go to Esther. You, you think, OK. I, this, this really struck me. And in a way, it connects back to what we've just been talking about. Uh, and this is as we're talking about the environment in the students' union. Student unions weren't very nice places in those days. I don't know if they've got better since, but still. Unlike the white boys in their left caucuses, if in doubt, just quote Marx, feminists have to speed read the female eunuch one week and then start making policy on sexism the next. This is the biggest thing for, for women since the suffragettes. We have to make it up as we go along, invent new language, new concepts. It's not been done before. Dale Spender says, patriarchy infects the very words we utter, no trivial matter. And that just made so much sense to me, that sense of kind of reading these wonderful books that made you realize you weren't going mad, that actually other women had exactly the same kind of experience and giving you solidarity when facing the kind of experience that uh, as was just going to describe to us in in this chapter a bit earlier uh, where sexism and kind of rugby clubism and horribleness were so normal in those days that it was just I, I don't know it was it was difficult to get anyone to take you seriously. If you talked about feminism, they'd say, oh, well, it's all about class or something like that. Mm. And it was as though we were beginners and they had it sorted. Mm. Well, you're pioneers, I would say, more than beginners. Pioneers, I think that's, you know, <laughs> Carving your way and, and inventing it as you go along. And that's right, you know, because you were taking what you were reading and putting it into practice in the world that you were in and trying to shape it. So Ezra, let's hear your section now, which is yeah. you stepping into leadership and telling them what's what. 
Yeah, I wanted to say that I tried to, I, I wrote the, um, most of the book in the present tense, uh, in my child voice, my adolescent voice, my adult voice, because I wanted to sort of get right into the, um, the whole, uh, um, the atmosphere and the feel of each particular age. And, uh, and in fact, I wrote it in this office, you know, speaking into the microphone, this microphone, so that um, it's actually my voice, literally, uh, that, you know, was typed up onto the page, uh, voice recognition, because I wanted to get that sense of immediacy and the excitement, because although it was, you know, the student union, you know, could be very threatening and very male dominated, at the same time, it was incredibly exciting. You know, it was like, uh, in the 1970s was the height of the black power movement, the anti apartheid movement the beginnings of the feminist movement and it was just like you know literally you felt like you were making history as we do today with the whole covid thing and so on so i wanted to kind of get that kind of excitement and i was absolutely terrified when i got up um in the students union and did this speech um in front of all these students every time a woman got up to speak um, the whole student body, and they used to turn up in, you know, in huge numbers at that time, no internet. So that's what we did for entertainment. And people would just shout off, off, off as soon as a woman got up to speak before you even started. So I was absolutely and terrified. They didn't mean get off the stage. They meant get your clothes off. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, both. <laughs> So, uh, so I was terrified, and the reason which was spurring us on was the women's lib movement had been a, a group had just been down to uh, protest against a grapple and strip. They call it a grapple and strip, which meant that it's naked women mud wrestling, and that was uh, the r rugby club's idea of fun for raising money for charity for Rag Week. So we, I said, right, we're not going to stand for this any longer. And some of the radical feminists were saying, oh, don't go into that patriarchal institution, the students' union, and start talking to those men. They won't listen. I said, look, I've paid my student dues. I'm entitled to go in there and say my piece. So, of course, I went in there, and uh, they, uh, the motion was, this house is against sexism. Well, nobody had heard the word sexism before, apart from the women's lib group. So I think they saw the first three letters and thought, this is going to be interesting. So literally nearly a thousand people. <laughs> I was like, ah. Oh. But anyway, I, I, I carried on, and I waited until they stopped shouting, and I just stood there. And eventually it was quiet and right, I'm in full flood here, you know, with my speech. <clears throat> you think it's just a bit of fun to shout off, off, off when a woman comes up here to speak? But we have the right to free speech as well. The very presence of strippers in our union undermines us. It robs us of the confidence to speak out and know we'll be heard. Call yourselves revolutionaries, socialists, rebels, Sexism, sexism is the deadly weapon used by our oppressors to divide us. Is our students' union on the, the side of the oppressors or do we support women's liberation? Another huge roar goes up from the audience. They know whose side they ought to be on at least. But I haven't finished yet. This motion will make sure this kind of thing never happens again. And that when we women walk in here, we will be listened to, taken seriously, treated with respect. We deserve that every bit as much as you men do. We are fighting for our freedom. Are you with us? I urge you to vote for this motion and banish sexism from our union forever. A sudden surge of energy and elation courses through me as I raise my clenched fist above my head. There's a fraction of a second's pause and then, yes, everybody is up on their feet, clapping, shouting, stomping their approval. I realise I've gone way over my three minutes, but the speaker doesn't care. He just bangs his gavel fee feebly and shrugs his shoulders. Then the minute taker grins at me and writes, standing ovation loud and sustained applause in the red minute book we won <laughs> now as well what tell us um what what come what was the audience was it mostly men in that audience yeah, what was yeah, the split between be, because, you know, there were far more men at university then than women yeah so it would be all white mostly men um and literally there was standing room only at the back and they were spilling out into the foyer because i know for a fact that you can only get 800 people in that hall. 
And um, so the rest of the overspill, there must have been at least a couple of hundred more. And I went into that, uh, they'd just done a portrait of me to hang up in the Senate where I used to organize the sit-ins. And uh, so I went back to Leicester to see it. And I walked into that hall and just imagined that scene for my research so that I had, you know, the atmosphere and everything. And I wrote this, you know, sitting on the stage where, I, where, I'd, done, uh, where I'd done that speech. Quite an emotional moment, really. Yeah, wonderful. And what year was it? Tell us the year this, this uh, happened. Uh, this would have been 1974. 1974. And we've got a comment in the chat from um, uh, from Manuela saying the student union experience is still very similar now too, so relatable. So I'm afraid perhaps it hasn't progressed as much as we would have liked it to. Okay. Um, if you want to comment in the chat or give us a question, you can use the chat to do so. So please do put a question to as wherever you would like to. We can field it and mix it in with the questions I'm asking as well. We've still got more to go, um, but really keen to hear from you as well. Um, and Fiona, I mean, you, you were obviously at university at the same time, and that's where you met. And tell us a bit more about your kind of shared experiences of reading, campaigning. Um, reading the book, there's an account of, a, of an NUS conference where I was too. And as well as noticing in the hall that there is only one other black person there, that's Trevor Phillips. And I kind of think back to what I noticed and I didn't notice that at all. And I think it's a reflection of the fact that you bring with you the kind of uh, your own uh, expectations and aspirations and so on. And you can be ignorant of how other people are perceiving the situation that they're in and beginning to be more aware of everybody else's experiences is a very important bit of kind of learning about society and growing up actually um, and is one of the sad thing that people are as ignorant as I was then is reflected in the kind of Black Lives Matter debate that's happening now because uh, the ignorance and denial of the experience of black people, which was made most clear in uh, George Floyd's murder by police, made me think back to a time a little bit after this when Joy Gardner was murdered by British police 27 years ago, when they crashed into her flat, uh, decided that she was due to be deported, although she thought that her appeal against deportation was still being considered. And uh, basically the British police murdered her in a very similar way to the murder that has been much more publicly acknowledged since. Are things better? Uh, possibly, but not enough. Yeah, absolutely not those, enough. And those incidents are still happening, exactly. Um, yeah, we've, we've even just seen data recently showing that black and minority ethnic people are more likely to be fined and penalised for being out during lockdown because they're more likely to be doing frontline jobs, but they're the ones being stopped and penalized on the streets. Um, there's a question coming in, um, and someone has been has asked, will we be exploring how this book came into being and the publication journey this afternoon? So should we, should we ask, answer that question first, Ezra, before we move on to the next mm -hmm. questions we've got on our schedule? Tell us a little bit more about well, the, the uh, challenge of getting published as a black author. Yeah, well, I got pub I got rejected from all the greats, Penguin, Virago, the whole lot of them said, this is a fantastic book, but we're not going to publish it. And I said, well, how can I change it to make you publish it? And they said, oh, no, we're not going to publish it. Don't change a word of it. It's fantastic. And you will find a home for it very soon. And by a home, I didn't realize what they meant. I thought, well, that's it then. It's not good enough. But actually, what they probably meant was you'll find a black publisher. I guess. Um, and uh, uh, meanwhile, my agent um, had sent it to um, a competition, Jacaranda, um, which is an all female, black female publishing house uh, with a very small team, had decided as their ambition for 2020 
to publish 20 books by writers of colour. So because they were fed up with the white industry saying, oh, we can't find any books. If we found any books by black authors that are good enough, we would publish them. Um, and th I think there's only 1% of all books in the country, less than 1% uh, uh, published by authors of colour in any one year in the UK. Um, so you can see how t what a tiny minority we are. And uh, Jacaranda had a national competition and got over 100 entries by black writers and chose 20. And I was very, very lucky to be one of them. And I think one of the things... Not lucky, but talented. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> but one of the things that is so great about that is that I'm not an only one. I'm actually with a whole cohort of the most wonderful writers. We've got memoirists, poets, you know, biographers, um, fiction writers, crime writers. In among the 20, there's every genre you could possibly wish to read. And we're all coming out one by one. And of course they chose 2020, which happened to be the year of COVID. So you can imagine, you know, all the bookshops closed as soon as my book was published uh, with my books in it. So I couldn't get them. And uh, all the uh, uh, printers closed. So the rest of them couldn't get published. By March, there was only three of us published. So all that time they had to, a huge struggle to get them out. Um, and I, you know, we, we meet, meet up on Zoom very regularly. I had a meeting last night with the, the Jacaranda 20 and 2020, the solidarity between us writers, helping each other to get out there and get sold and get, you know, get noticed online and so on. It's tremendous. So in a way it's a good end to the story, but I did feel that same old feeling of I'm not good enough. I've got to try 10 times as hard to be half as good. And uh, the, I, I'm just so thrilled at the way my book has been actually received because I never had faith in it, really. I just thought, well, probably it's not good enough to be published. Um, but I've, I've got a lot of joy in, in feeling that it resonates with people. Well, it certainly does. And it's a, it's, it is a really wonderful read. And I'm just going to give you a couple more comments from the chat before we return to our questions. Um, one comment from one of our guests is saying, I'm a couple of years younger, didn't go to uni, started work in 74, shy, sheltered upbringing, what a shock, rampant sexism, male superiority, put down remarks, that's what made me a feminist. Um, and uh, another question, just for information, someone's asking the name of the female victim you were talking about, Fiona, that was Joy Gardner, wasn't it? The yes, it was. Talking about the case. Um, uh, and I think, were you working for JCWI at that point? Was that no, it was, I was still on the committee of JCWI, the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, which I had been the director of. So I was kind of alert to it then. But, you know, we think that no one was prosecuted, nobody apologised, and they kind of lied to her family about how she'd been killed. It was really, really extreme. Uh, and as you say, there are still extreme examples of uh, deaths at the hands of the police. But uh, have things got better? I think now we would have an inquiry or an apology, and we didn't then. You know, you think about there's still gross injustice. Windrush is an example of people with every legal right to be in Britain being deported effectively. And, uh, and that's still uh, the apology, the compensation that people are due still hasn't happened to very many of them. So we've still got the same kind of gross injustice that we had 27 years ago. I'm just going to put another question to Ezra about being, being a, an author and then we'll come back to the questions we've got planned for the event. So someone's saying, I'm working on a non-fiction anthology exploring multiracial identities as well. We'd love to have some insight on how to polish my work to its best standard and hopefully be able to get an agent or a publisher. And then another question saying, how did you start writing? How did you get an agent? How long was the whole journey? So just say a little bit more about that journey. Yeah, um, well, uh, recently, uh, because of what's happened with Black Lives Matter, um, we've um, set up um, 
a, a Black Writers Guild, which is taking on the white publishing industry now. And it's headed up by people like um, Benjamin Zephaniah and Afwa Hirsch and many of the um, black writers we have today. And I'm part of that group. There's over a hundred of us now. Um, so uh, if you're um, a published writer, then you should uh, definitely join us. And we are um, leaning on the publishing industry to uh, invest in black writers because we get paid less, we get less advance, we get less um, promotion and less uh, um, spent on, you know, uh, books. And, and literally we do, we have to do very short print, print runs. The industry standard is for the first book you, you published 5,000 copies. Mine was 750 and it went just like that. So because, you know, there's not enough money in the industry uh, for black writers. So uh, we, we are um, trying to challenge that. As far as the actual journey went, um, uh, I, I've, I realize I've always been a writer. Um, some of my books over there are just stacks of um, my journals uh, that go right back. I've got extracts from my 16 year old diary. In the That's book. how you remember so much detail. Yeah. I was thinking, <laughs> how did she do that? I can't remember that stuff. I write it down. I now understand. Yeah, but also, and I and I actually don't. I see everything as archives. Like you know, my my black leather skirt slit to the the thigh that I wore. You know, long skirt that I wore in the seventies. I've still got that skirt. <laughs> I've got clothes that were fifty years old. So and photographs. So actually, if you're going to be a writer, don't throw anything away. Don't, you know, it may be trash to them, but to you, it's archives, right? So um, I definitely uh, did, uh, I, I definitely- did. Your mic's gone a bit quiet, Isabel. That's it, bring your mic up. I, I definitely, uh, I, um, I kept everything, but also I interviewed my uh, family, all my extended family in Ghana and the UK. I did more than 50 interviews asking people if they've ever felt different and what they remember of my difference as a child and so on. And once you turn on your memory muscle, literally I was dreaming about people I'd forgotten, I'd even met. It was just amazing. So I think you, you, once you get in what they call the flow and find your voice, it's just an extraordinary thing. It takes you over and you don't care whether you're going to get published or not. You just got to keep writing, writing on the tube and, you know, always take um, a notebook with you and a pen, especially in the loo. Because in the loo is where I usually get my best ideas when I'm miles away from the computer. So you just kind of get the excitement of being a writer. And honestly, some of the things that I was editing were for my diary written in 1986. You know, my night nervous breakdown chapter uh, was absolutely word for word what I'd written in my diary, minus the swear words. But, you know, it, it's all there. So just keep your stuff and, uh, and just keep going. That's what I'd advise. That's lovely advice. I love the memory muscle line. That's great. Um, and if you are interested in the case of Joy Gardner and in the history of that period, can I also recommend the Bernie Grant Trust to you? It's a really fascinating archive there of all of Bernie Grant's activism and political activity as well. So please do have a look at that. Um, I want to bring us up a little bit more to the present day now, um, and particularly reflecting on Black Lives Matter and, and all the work that you're doing there. And I know you're going to tell us a little bit more about what's going on in Tooting and, and your activism every weekend there. Um, and to have another reading from the book, which uh, connects your feminism and your anti-racist activism as well. So fast forward to the present day. How are you feeling now about your, you know, the movement, your sense of optimism, pessimism? How, you know, are you feeling things have got better? Are you feeling like now is a moment where things are really going to change? I think now is really, really exciting. I've never felt more optimistic and more positive and more excited about the possibilities of the future. I've always been an optimist. I can't help it. It's, you know, in my genes. You know, I just get, give me a challenge. I'll, I'll make something of it, you know. Um, so I think um, at the moment, um, there's a kind of confluence of, um, as I say, of COVID and Black Lives Matter. And I think we were talking earlier about these two kind of narratives. On the one hand, we've got, you know, black women on the front line of COVID, as cleaners, as carers, as workers, as people who are likely to be most uh, vulnerable to the e economic and health and political effects of COVID. And at the same time, we've got all our black women political leaders, you know, who the, the three women actually set up the Black Lives Matter movement in 
2013. You know, we got a, a woman who uh, um, set up the um, Me Too movement, black woman who uh, spearheaded that movement. We've got people um, like uh, Crenshaw who actually um, invented the term uh, intersectionality, which is um, something that everybody uses. So we've got black women in leadership, never mind women all over the world in leadership, the best uh, performing governments are headed by women and led by women in this time of COVID. So we've got a fantastic story to tell about how women's leadership can really work and that, that you know, the bully boy kind of uh, uh, strongman leadership of, uh, of Boris and Trump et al. don't get you anywhere and that uh, we need a different kind of world. Not uh, and not least because, you know, we've had the financial crash, we've had our environmental uh, crisis, we had the um, Me Too movement crisis in, in the feminist movement, all coming before COVID. And it seems to me if the world doesn't wake up now, they never will. Um, and one of the things that really delights me is that uh, growing up as a kid with no, very few role models, there's now plenty of black women role models that, you know, well, the too numerous to mention or count. Um, but I can remember when really there were very few, a lot of them were writers like uh, Maya Angelou and Alice Walker, Toni Morrison. Um, but one of the ones that has most influenced me, of course, is Angela Davis, because she was not just a writer, but she was also um, a, an activist and a socialist. And she you know, took the world stage um, as a campaigner. And she had the most magnificent afro, which I wore my hair in an afro at that time as well, in the 1970s, wearing your natural with pride. And um, she, I, I, I remember meeting her for the first time. I've met her several times since, but I remember being totally starstruck meeting her for the first time when she came over to London. She was at Ta Hackney Town Hall as a speaker and uh, we met her um, and all, I was on the organising committee of her visit. And then afterwards, we all went, just a small group of us, went for drinks afterwards in King's Cross. And uh, you'll hear some famous names in this little bit of it as well, uh, which I'm sure you'll recognise. <clears throat> in the early hours of that morning, we found ourselves on the edge of the red light district in a first floor flat in King's Cross, drinking neat high proof Jamaican rum, Mia's friend, having Roy, our host, having run out of mixers. With the lights of King's Cross winking outside, there were just seven of us in that dimly lit room, Roy, Mia and me, Diane Abbott and Janet Boateng and Angela's partner listening enthralled to Angela expounding on the way the white feminist movement has failed to recognize the struggles of black women and that you can't have feminism without getting rid of capitalism. Diane and Janet regaled us with tales of the trials of black women in local UK politics. All our struggles are inextricably linked, all a consequence of the colonial legacy and patriarchy, poverty, exploitation, racism, sexism, exclusion, inspiring. So I think that really inspired me and my politics uh, ever since then. And I heard uh, Angela talking um, recently uh, at the WOW Festival, for all of those of you that, um, that uh, were there, um, there was a live stream 24 hours in June and Angela came on at midnight and uh, she talked about how exciting the time is now and how positive she felt about it and that the world was waking up and actually listening and, uh, and that people were thinking about and implementing things, you know, ideas that I've always been passionate about, like having a national basic wage for everybody and so on. You know, who knew Boris would be practically, you know, in implementing this kind of program. So I think actually we have to think of different ways of organizing the world and different, you know, that all these things that, you know, growth and social mobility and money and wages and all, we've all got, we've got to rethink that whole thing and the relationship between it, not just get back to normal again, but think about literally a new normal, which involves a transformation of the, of, of, of the way we do things now. And I, I want to show you my teapot again. That's our to-do list, smash the patriarchy and 
destroy right, white supremacy. If we can do <laughs> those two things, uh, you know, we, the, we can make the world a better place. And I think this is the time when, it, I haven't seen this since the anti-apartheid movement, when black, white, brown and everybody is getting together and starting to think of a new agenda. Some surprising people are doing that, you know, rethinking the whole system. So now's the time, people. We mustn't give up, you know? We've got to make an opportunity. And I have to say that people are always talking about, oh, things will never change, or we won't get equality at this rate for another 200 years for women. Well, actually, um, history shows us that change doesn't happen in, you know, incrementally. Sometimes shed loads of it happen. There's a tipping point and then lots of things change. I think we're at one of those tipping points now and we just got to keep on going. Fawcett has been doing brilliant work. I've been watching what you've been doing on COVID and so on, really stepping up to it. I'm really proud of my sisters and being part of this movement, absolutely. Oh, thank you, that's, that's wonderful. And Fiona, what's, what's your reflections on this moment in time? You know, this confluence as, as was presented it of feminist change and activism, but also, you know, anti-racism and the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm not quite as optimistic as Esra sounds, but the thing I know is this, that that kind of change, just that tipping point just doesn't happen. You have to make it happen. You have to do what it says on the teapot. I have to say, uh, Ezra, lots of people are asking you where they can get one. So you must tell us before the end of this. Well, I had it specially made for me. <laughs> it's product placement, that is. Product placement at a Fawcett event. Normally we only do Fawcett. <laughs> yeah, but it's not happening because she had it specially made for her. Anyway. <laughs> All right, well, what do you do You really need to make things happen. And it's one of the things that Fawcett does is just keeps pushing this agenda keeps using all the opportunities there are to kind of raise people's consciousness to make sure that even things like the um, centenary of us getting a vote for the first time is actually a moment of reminding women of their power and the fact that it's really very recent that we've had any. You know, we yeah. still have a tiny handful of women leading our big companies it's one or two i think and we just need to keep shoving at it because if we don't keep shoving at it the moment will pass and we won't change things and we won't actually get the kind of shift that Esra boldly says and rightly says we ought to be able to get out of this crisis yeah I th I, yeah i think that, that basically i had a i i rewrote my own script you know i i was a kid a little kid on clapton common and i didn't know my dad and i was an only one and i went to ghana 37 years later and found him and became queen of my village in ghana and i think you know uh, happy endings do happen. I honestly think that's such an unlikely story. That, you know, I believe in magic. I really do. <laughs> but you have to make it. it and it is a, a wonderful personal story, but it is also this amazing book about, you know, social change and action and Thank your journey of identity and consciousness. So it's got all of those elements sort of wrapped together in it. There's one thing I wanted to ask you because someone's put a question in the chat, which I think is a very good question, which is really about institutional sexism and racism. And mm. you know, ultimately um, it's about changing institutions, changing systems, isn't it really? If we really want to drive change in at the kind of scale that you're talking about. So they want to you just say a little bit more about your experience of the space between black and white while working within institutions. So you're, you know, that experience of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question, yeah, because um, by trade, I'm a strategist and facilitator. So I can say that I've been into a lot of institutions um, and get paid to tell them what's wrong and how to put it right, which is a great job. <laughs> they don't always uh, um, uh, follow my advice, of course. Um, but uh, I've worked in the international development movement, which is going through crisis. I've worked in the feminist movement. I've worked in um, uh, different charities, disability charities, and uh, you know, fair trade, you name it. I've got over a hundred clients that I've worked for, organizations, all over the, the world, as well as in the UK. So I think I've got a pretty good idea that even organizations that have 
you know, quite see themselves as quite radical, are actually structured along patriarchal lines. They've often got a board, and you know, like Fawcett, really, it's the classic model, the board and the members and la, la, la. And you get up a dynamic in that, you know, of power relations. And everyone tries really hard to fix it, but actually the structures are the thing that we need to change, but they're enshrined in law. So it's really, you know, you can't always get out of that. So I think in the rethinking, everything has to happen. We have to have a new models. Um, we have to have flexible models. We have to have, you know, ownership uh, based on relationships rather than on, uh, on hierarchies and structures. Um, we can have a new way of doing it. And um, one of the things that I very much do as a facilitator and a strategist is I believe in um, a collaborative um, uh, and distributive power so that in the thinking space when we're de generating the strategy or thinking about poverty or whatever, um, or thinking about our goals going forward, I always have that participatory framework and I believe that that's not just a way of doing things, it's a principle of mine and the more that people can embed those participatory methodologies in their institutions, the more we're going to get this uh, feeling of transformation of, of uh, organizations. So I haven't given up my day drop job because you don't earn any money out of, out of books. <laughs> but we're going to make sure you do because we're going to oh, sell. Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But, you know, <laughs> but, but so, what yeah, you're I'm saying about, that work. Sorry? about the participatory framework and so on. Is yeah. In my view, exactly where the government's gone wrong in managing the whole uh, COVID experience, that, that it's very similar kind of, you know, posh white boys, bless them, uh, running the committees and the things which are deciding how to respond to mm. the different, I mean, it's very hard getting this right. I remember I was in government but the different crises that are coming up one by one. And the fact that there are no leading women's voices in there is one of the reasons why Britain, just like America, just yeah. like Brazil, all places which have a very blokish culture, which do not have leading women's voices, are messing it up, frankly. Absolutely. It's a real example of how being more participatory, involving women's voices in the discussion about strategy is essential if you want to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. And just to give you another woman's voice from our chat, um, one of our guests is saying, as a woman with an acquired disability who has been part of the disability living movement, I can relate to the message from Ezra. Thank you for your encouragement and optimism. Oh, that's great, because my mum is actually disabled. She's been disabled from the age of 10. And um, so I've um, learned a lot about her experience from her talking about it. And I've always, you know, very mindful of that kind of intersectionality that we lived it, it through in our own family, really. And we, I feel very close to that whole, you know, experience, not having had it myself, but um, being very close to a mother that has, has done so. And now we're just coming to the last couple of minutes of the event. So I'm going to just go back to our panel for final thoughts. Please do go on to Ezra's website. We've put the link in the chat function there for you. Go to the Jacaranda website, buy copies of Ezra's book, but also support the other writers. We have to we stand in solidarity with them at a time when it's really challenging for them to sell their, their books. Um, Ezra's book has just been reprinted, so you will be able to buy copies. It's sold out very, very quickly but we, we know that there are more being printed so you will be able to buy more. Um, now I just want to come back to um, you both for a final word. Fiona, let me come to you first. Reflections then on how we go forward. Of course it's doing our best in this sort of Covid struggle but what, what should we be doing now going forward? What do you think is our kind of lessons both from this conversation and, and what's happening in the world outside? Well I, I, I mean I think our biggest challenge right now is helping people deal with society as it is. So we can't do our usual going to work because there's no childcare. Um, the kids are out of school and have been for a scarily long time. There's all sorts of things out of kilter. And I think in an out of kilter moment is the moment that you need to say, let's invent a new kilter, as it were. Let's change how we view things. Let's 
recognise that childcare is infrastructure, not just bridges are infrastructure. If you want to have a successful society, let's recognise that diversity in leadership strengthens institutions, whether they're shops or countries. And I think that's the challenge for us, actually helping to invent how we can shift the kind of axis of society in order to make it fit women, black people better. At the moment, we're the odd ones out, although of course women are majority of the population, mm -hmm. but their sense of being the odd one out, not the only one that they're not part of uh, kind of leadership is a sense which is disabling for women, disabling for black people. And Fawcett's job is to end that sense and to try to redesign, help to redesign society so that women's lives work better. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. And if we get it right for women, we get it right for everyone because yeah, lives are actually going to become more like women's lives. Ezra, final word to you. Yeah, I think, you know, not build, 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 but care, care, care. That's what we need. That absolutely becomes the center point of the way um, society is structured. And I think... Um, uh, oh, I, you know, I've got lots of optimistic ideas and people are saying to me, oh, that won't work. That will never change. People will always be very selfish, etc. cetera. Um, and actually there was an outbreak of kindness and caring right here in Tooting when uh, lockdown happened. People were out on their streets clapping for, you know, black workers and essential workers in the NHS. People were looking after the neighbours, bringing in shopping for people. Uh, you know, there was just a whole new way of working and everybody, I mean, this is restaurant land around here. All the restaurant people were out in the streets selling their, you know, veg boxes. We never ate so well. It was really amazing. Um, so I thought it was one of the best times in my life. I felt, you know, like socialism had broken out. And very recently we have started in the last six weeks meeting on Clapham Common. I'm the QC, the Queen of Ceremonies up there on, Cla on sorry, on Tooting Common every, uh, every Sunday. And we have local... Um, speakers, historians, all sorts of people come up on the common, like uh, up to a thousand people we've had if the weather's nice. And you just think there's a thousand people in that are prepared to say Black Lives Matter. Bring their kids. I think, I think we're losing our link, Ezra. I think, I think yeah. you're, you're getting it frozen. So I'm going to bring the event to a close now. Um, we've got okay. a lovely message. Lots of people thanking us, lots of people saying this has been a really inspirational event. So uplifting at a time when it is easy to feel hopeless and that good change can happen. So it's really important right, to have you. these opportunities. I want to say a massive thank you to Fiona McTaggart, our chair, for being part of this conversation and sharing her memories and, and uh, reflections on the book and on feminism and how we go forward. And also a huge thank you to Ezra, both for writing the book and giving us this opportunity to have that conversation um, and for being such an inspirational, positive sister to us all um, I really love her dearly and I'm really delighted to have done this event with her and please do go to the website support for six work we really can't do what we do without your support we rely on our membership contributions and donations for our independent source of income so that we can challenge government challenge power and try to drive change in the way that we've been talking about today we're taking August off to care for our staff and care for each other but we're going to be back in September with a fascinating program of uh, more virus-free content as well as more COVID conversations. But thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.